Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's version of the September Surgery Symposium. I'm Dr. Andrew Weiner, Chief of Urology and Director of Robotic Surgery here at Kings County, New York City Health and Hospitals, Kings County. Uh, welcome to our Facebook live stream. I will be presenting a slide set today on both robotic surgery as well as prostate cancer and prostate health. So I hope you enjoy and learn something new, maybe that you hadn't learned before. So let's go ahead and jump right into the slide set. So again, like I said, today is uh, our next edition of September Surgery Symposium, where we're highlighting different surgical options and uh, uh, opportunities here at New York Health and Hospitals, Kings County. Uh, my area and of expertise and passion is robotic surgery and particular prostate health and prostate cancer. So I'm gonna feature a number of the latest uh, and greatest technology and advances that we have to offer here. Again, I'm the Chief Urology and the Director of Robotic Surgery. So what is robotic surgery? I have a lot of people that come to me and ask, well, what, what exactly does robotic surgery mean? Robotic surgery is actually robotic assisted surgery, and it allows surgeons to perform complex procedures with more control and precision and flexibility than is possible with the conventional or traditional surgeries. We consider robotic surgery a type of minimally invasive surgery, and what that means is we can do procedures through very small incisions, as opposed to the traditional surgical approach where we're making larger, uh, more invasive sur uh, surgical incisions. To the right of this screen, you can see our operating room with our surgical robot. And it has a number of components, which we're gonna go into in a few minutes. But as you can see, it's very, uh, very high tech and uh, involved and requires a lot of expertise, both from the surgical surgeon side, as well as the support staff, staff side. Just a, a brief moment on the origins of robotic surgery. I thought I'd take a minute to talk about uh, how the robot came to be. It was actually designed and created uh, through a combination of industry research as in conjunction with the Department of Defense. Initially, it was conceptualized for the stabilization of injured troops in the combat zone. So you can see to the right here in this picture, um, it's, it's from a, an old publication, but the concept was that you would have a mash type unit uh, where a surgeon could be inside of a vehicle that was not in the primary combat zone where they could be operating and stabilizing troops who were injured in the combat zones that were off uh, in the far off distance. It's a form of telehealth that uh, you'll see has continued to grow over time, but still even the latest version of robotic surgery that we use today is still a form of telehealth that can be expanded into other uh, opportunities in the future, such as remote surgery from far off distance, distant places. Uh, and that is obviously something that is still in development, but it's a potential. The FDA approved the use for this surgical robot in 2000, and this was one of several iterations of a robot that was designed. Um, and Intuitive's Da Vinci surgical robot was the design that won, won out over the other three. So there was the ASUP, the uh, PSI, and the uh, uh, Hercules that was, and the Hermes that was, uh, that were designed previously, but they were not, uh, they were found to be inferior and Da Vinci robot kind of won out in that battle. Um, and since that time, there's been widespread use into many surgical fields, and uh, we will show you some of those as we proceed. Again, the evolution of minimally invasive surgery started with laparoscopic surgery, where the surgeon was holding the instruments and holding the camera and using, again, small, inc small incisions, but um, the manual dexterity was far inferior and the visualization was, was very difficult because you were relying on somebody else to hold your camera. A number of operations are still done laparoscopically, but you'll see since 1999, 2000, since the FDA approved it, there have been a 
a, 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 um, a number of different devices that have uh, come to fruition. And uh, we currently use the, the DaVinci XI, which is the latest uh, form of this that came out in 2014. Um, but this allows the surgeon to control all of the various robotic arms on his or her own, rather than relying on somebody else to hold the camera. Um, and still in the experimental phase, it's being used in a number of institutions, but this is the single port robot. So whereas you have a number of arms that control different instruments in the 2014 XI version, uh, the SP or the single port robot has all of those arms enclosed in one. So that's something to look forward to in the future. Now, what is the surgical robot? Let's go into some of the details. So the robotic surgical system provides 3D high def views that the surgeon can look into the, the surgical console and see things at a much, much more defined uh, view than, than previously. It creates a surgical area that's magnified 10 times to what the human eye can see, uses tiny instruments that, mute, that move more like a human hand uh, with greater range of motion, and it, there's tremor minimizing technology that allows for increased precision. The two main components of the surgical robot are the surgical console and the patient cart. The console, if you'll look on the left-hand side of the screen, has a viewfinder that you can look into and see the 3D uh, magnified view. And then there's handheld controls that will allow you to control the, ro the robotic arms. And you see there's foot pedals. On the left side, there's a camera control. And on the right side, those are to, to control uh, the movements or the, the cautery that you can use uh, with the instruments uh, from any of the arms. What do some of the ports and the scars look like? Well, it's very similar to laparoscopic surgery where we insert small ports uh, into the patient so that we can get our robotic instruments in. And one of those is used as a camera port. Uh, and, a, and one of them is an assistant port and the others are for the robotic arms themselves. And they're different sizes. They range from eight millimeters to 12 millimeters or 1.2 centimeters. On the right-hand side, this is a uh, sample of what a robotic prostatectomy would look like in comparison to the traditional open surgical incision. And you can see approximately 10 to 12 centimeter incision in the lower abdomen versus five one centimeter incisions uh, throughout the abdomen that usually get covered uh, by, the, by either the patient's hair or um, they'll, they'll heal and you can barely even see them. I get this question very frequently that asking me whether or not the surgeon is the one that, or the, the surgeon's the one that's doing the operation or the robot is in control. And I wanna sort of allay some of those concerns and the surgeon truly is in control of the, the da Vinci robotic device. So it's often, I think that the term robotic in this case happens to be a bit misleading. The robots do not perform surgery in these cases. Your surgeon is the one who is doing it and controlling the arms from this, uh, this robotic console that is just to the side of the room uh, from, the, from the patient. I like to say that it takes a village to do robotic surgery. And the reason I say this is because it's really not just the surgeon and the robot. It's a combination of those two, and those two as well as a uh, skilled bedside assistant. So you'll have somebody, a clinician at the bedside at all times who's passing instruments in and out, who's passing sutures in and out, or suctioning anything that needs to be suctioned, et cetera. And if there is an issue, or something goes awry, there's always somebody who's there at the bedside immediately to take over. Robotically trained nurses and surgical technicians are in every case. And then we have on-site or virtual te technical support if there's any mechanical issues. What are some of the advantages of robotic surgery over traditional surgery or laparoscopic surgery for that matter? Well, shorter hospitalization, fewer number of hospital days after, after 
traditional surgeries, often there's reduced pain and discomfort because you're making smaller incisions and because we have more precise uh, view and smaller instruments, we don't have to dissect through all unnecessary healthy tissue and we can go straight to the organ of interest. Faster recovery times and return to normal activities. Again, smaller incisions resulting in reduced risk of infection, reduced blood loss and the need for transfusions. Minimal scarring, so there's a, a better aesthetic uh, component to this as well. A few slight disadvantages of ro robotic surgery are that surgeries can take a little bit longer. As you can imagine, there are a number of pieces, a number of pieces of equipment that have to be uh, set up. So the ports have to be placed. The robotic co uh, console has to be docked over the patient. The surgery takes place, and then you have to undock and then remove whatever organ was being removed. Uh, so that, that can take a little bit longer as opposed to just making your incision and going down into the, into the patient's abdomen or wherever you're working. There is a learning curve. It takes time to learn the ins and outs of robotic surgery. So uh, I don't recommend that robotic surgery take place at every hospital unless you have a design team who uh, can manage through some of the complications and the issues that arise. So we here at, at uh, NYC Health and Hospitals Kings County have a very skilled, not just surgical team, but also nursing team and surgical tech team. Um, and also our central sterile knows exactly uh, how to prep our instruments. So it takes a whole team to do this. Um, as we've talked about, there are a number of Piece of, piece of equipment, and these are costly. It can cost up to $2.5 million to buy the Da Vinci robot, and that's just the one-time purchase, and that doesn't include the maintenance, which is about a million dollars a year. So all of the disposable pieces of equipment, they do cost money. So we're very fortunate to have this piece of equipment here at our hospital. So when did our robot arrive at Kings County? Well, we actually named our robot Casey uh, because we love her so much and uh, Casey Kings County. So Casey arrived on uh, in December of 2018. We did our first procedure on uh, January 7th, 2019. It was a robotic prostatectomy and you can see the team that was involved on the right here. And since that time, we've done over 350 cases of various types from different services. So if we've grown from just doing urologic procedures to a number of other different procedures. So we have general surgery involved, bariatric surgery, hepatobiliary, urogynecologic surgery, ENT, urology, and we'll be having gynecologic oncology back hopefully soon. So you can see we offer a wide array of different options from a surgical standpoint. Now, not every patient is a candidate for robotic surgery. So I would suggest that you, know, you listen and have a discussion with your surgeon, but um, if you are a surgical candidate for robotic surgery, uh, we do have a number of services that are available to you here. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the training options, uh, because as I talked about before, there is a learning curve to learning robotic surgery. And we're extremely fortunate to offer simulation packages here. So the robotic console that I showed uh, in the previous slides where you're looking into the, the quote unquote video game console, they have simulators where you can essentially practice your skills with the camera uh, and clutching and the cautery all on these simulated uh, lab type procedures. So you can practice over here on the left placing rings over hooks. You can you know, put jacks into different components and different uh, uh, canisters, and you can actually start to do, there's, there's more advanced simulation packages where you can do parts of the robotic prostatectomy, for instance, um, and you can go through the entire procedure. So as a training facility, we, it's really nice that we can offer this for our, our trainees so that we can train the next gen, generation of surgeons. So just as far as takeaways from the robotic surgery standpoint, 
Uh, I would like to mention that in properly selected patients, robotic surgery does provide many advantages over traditional surgery. Here at our hospital, we offer the latest robotic technology in many of the services that I mentioned. And if you or your provider are interested in having uh, the patient uh, go undergo robotic surgery in the fields that we mentioned, please speak to your doctor or reach out to one of our representatives here at the hospital and ask if it's right for you. So now I'm just gonna pivot a little bit away from robotic surgery specifically and talk about my other passion, which is urology and prostate cancer. So I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about advances in prostate cancer detection and treatment. So what is the prostate gland? Well, it's a, it's a male organ uh, that makes fluid and forms part of the semen. And it's located just below the bladder in front of the rectum, as you can see in the pictures over to the right. Now it surrounds the urethra, which is the P-tube, and that is why men, as they get older, have some, may have some issues urinating because as they get older, their prostate can get larger and thus clamp down on the urethra, making the urine flow less smoothly, uh, making the bath have to go to the bathroom more often, et cetera, et cetera. So as we get older, the prostate can get larger. It can also, those cells can also turn into malignant cells or cancer cells. So let's talk specifically about prostate cancer and some of the facts. Well, I'm going to start with the bad news. The bad news is that prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men in the United States after skin cancer. It occurs more commonly in African Americans than in white men, and they're about two to three times more likely to die from the disease than white men. The good news is that in most cases, prostate cancer grows very slowly. So we talk in prostate cancer world about turtles, rabbits, and birds. And so we try and figure out which are the turtles and that are gonna progress slowly and hopefully not cause any damage throughout their life. The rabbits, they may move a little quicker, but we can get to them before they cause any untoward side effects or complications. And then if we have a bird, we have to figure out which ones are gonna spread to other parts of the body and potentially uh, kill our patients. And we have to make sure that we're very vigilant in screening for these, these types of cancers because of that. Most men with prostate cancer are older than 65 and typically don't die from the disease. So in terms of detection and treatment, I'm gonna talk about prevention, early detection, diagnosis, staging, and treatment. As far as prevention goes, the only tried and true method of preventing prostate cancer that has been shown in the literature is a balanced diet. So high fruits and vegetables, heart healthy diet has been shown to decrease your prostate cancer risk by about twofold. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked at aspirin use, vitamin D, a number of multivitamin studies, but they either have to be taken in very high doses or the results are equivocal. Balanced diet is the key. For early detection, we use a blood test, a very simple blood test called the PSA, the prostate specific antigen. And many of you have heard of this blood test um, and may even use it in your practices. While we know that the PSA is not the perfect screening tool, meaning that it can be high in some cases that are not cancer and it can be low in cases that may be cancer, what we've found is that on average, uh, checking screening for the PSA will save approximately 23% of the lives as compared to the prior, prior to the PSA use in the early 80s. What we have to do is we have to use the PSA smartly though. Every person who has a mildly elevated PSA does not go for treatment. It's a discussion with your doctor and with your surgeon potentially or your radiation oncologist as to what to do next but I'll go into this later a little bit more. It's all about knowing your numbers, providing information and knowledge so that you are in, in, in control of your own destiny. Trying to prevent those birds, as I talked about. The average levels for the PSA can differ slightly by race and, eth race and ethnicity. And then the other way of detecting prostate cancer early is the digital rectal exam, which we commonly perform 
uh, for men. Typically, I recommend starting prostate cancer screening at the age of 45 for any patient with a risk factor that includes African-American men, those with a family history, or um, if those with a family history or over the age of 65, those are the risk factors. But typically, if they are if they have a family member who had prostate cancer or are African American, I usually get a single PSA at the age of 45. If not, they can wait till either age 50 or 55 to get their first PSA checked. In terms of diagnosis, we use a transrectal ultrasound biopsy if their PSA is elevated and there's been a joint decision made between the patient and the provider. Uh, we go up through the rectum with an ultrasound probe and we take uh, 12 cores systematically to identify all the different areas of the prostate. Uh, what's becoming more and more gold standard is to utilize MRIs to help guide our prostate biopsies. So it's an MR fusion biopsy where we'll take the MRI and we will fuse it with technology that allows us to isolate the lesion and um, pinpoint our needles towards the region of interest and still sample the other areas. Uh, we're also, there's also some talk in the field of urology about maybe moving away from transrectal and going more transperineal, which is the area between the scrotum and the anus, so as to decrease the risk of infection. But for right now, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsies are the gold standard. In terms of staging, if a patient is diagnosed with prostate cancer, uh, we use either a multiparametric MRI to look at different types of um, uh, phases of, of diffusion within the, uh, the MRI to help us determine how aggressive the lesion is. Uh, and then we can use a CAT scan or a whole body bone scan to see if the cancer has spread to other parts of the body. Once diagnosed with prostate cancer, it completely depends on the type of prostate cancer you have. It can range from anywhere from very low grade, non-invasive and indolent, meaning again, non-aggressive, to extremely aggressive and one that needs to be treated uh, with aggressive therapy. So in the, the former, in the less aggressive types, we offer active surveillance, which is a, a modality where we can just follow the patient and um, monitor them over time for any progression or worsening of disease. Uh, in the higher, so in the intermediate and higher risk cases, we can offer surgery, both open and robotic. I talked a, quite a bit about the robotic option, uh, but there are a number of surgeons out there who are still doing it open. Um, and that, again, is a discussion with your surgeon. Uh, there's a number of radiation options, which are non-surgical options uh, delivering radioisotopes to the body so that they, you can eliminate the prostate cancer cells and cure prostate cancer essentially effect, as effectively as surgery. And again, there's different options for that. Then there are more experimental therapies like high frequency ultrasound, where they use ultrasound to ablate the prostate cancer cells, or cryoablation, which is where we freeze the prostate cancer and some of the surrounding cells. There are some other therapies looking at um, infusion of gold nanoparticles and then heating up those nanoparticles. So there's a number of experimental therapies out there, but truly the gold standard is either active surveillance for non-aggressive surgery or radiation for the more aggressive types. Going back to the treatment for uh, the surgical treatment for prostate cancer, we had talked a bit about this before, but you can see on the left, on the upper image, uh, the old surgical uh, incision for, a, uh, for an open prostatectomy. It's about 10 to 12 centimeters. And the uh, robotic prostatectomy, you can make about five, one or so centimeter incisions. Um, this is, again, the robotic setup below. Uh, the advantages of robotic surgery, just to reiterate, less pain, less blood loss, shorter hospital stay better visualization and a little bit easier on the surgeon. And disadvantages, as we mentioned, a bit longer OR times, it can be a bit costly and there is a learning curve involved uh, in this with this procedure. Ultimately, 
what we care most about is the oncologic and functional outcomes of the patient. So oncologic meaning cancer care. So the elimination of cancer is the same between robotic and open. And functionally, if in experienced open surgical hands, uh, the functional out outcomes are the same. Although in newer generation and newer studies, they're coming out that the functional outcomes may be slightly better in the robotic surgical approach. A few radiation options. So these are the brachytherapy seeds that you may have heard of. What these are, um, are radioisotopes. So it's a, a radio light labeled um, seed that are that is implanted into the prostate. And uh, there is a sphere of radiation that is emitted around the seed so as to cause both cancer and, and normal tissue destruction uh, within the prostate in a controlled zone. So you're, you're truly just trying to kill the, the prostate cancer cells. And uh, if you put the seeds in in the right place, you will minimize uh, tissue damage around the prostate. And you can see the size of the, uh, the seed is about the size of a grain of rice. Another common modality is external beam radiotherapy. And the options that you may have heard of are CyberKnife, which is a form of radiotherapy. Uh, it's just high intensity radiation given over a short course. Uh, or uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy, or IMRT. And that's what we see here to the right. Um, this is a patient, and you can see the different colors indicate how much radiation or how hot the radiation is at that at the crosshairs of, of the radiation beam. So um, what you see is in pink and red, it, that's where the radiation is hottest, and it's right there smack on the prostate. And all the other radiation zones are much cooler so that the, the healthy tissue, the rest of your body, is not getting... Uh, the type of cell damage that the prostate the prostate is, and it minimizes complications and side effects from radiation therapy. I want to spend just a minute on the PSA controversy. So those patients who see, uh, those those providers who see patients in their office and have heard in the news, you know, in the, in the New York Times, the and PBS and Wall Street Journal, there's. Uh, there was a panel that came out in 2012 discussing the utilization of PSA. And what we found after 2012, when the USPSTF, the United States Pre Preventative Services Task Force, downgraded the use of PSA uh, to a great category D, is that we saw an uptick in more aggressive cancers, and there was a considerable outcry from the medical community to change that. And it has since been upgraded back up to a grade C um, recommendation, which means that it is recommended uh, to have a discussion with your provider about the, whether or not PSA screening is right for you. Ultimately, what the task force was trying to prevent was overdiagnosis of prostate cancer leading to unnecessary can to therapies. But what I would recommend or suggest is to talk with your doctor. Know your numbers. Know what's right for you. And knowledge is power, truly. And you can make the decision or the patient can make the decision based on um, a number of things. But if they're educated about what they're dealing with, um, then we can at least start to have the conversation. The worst thing that could possibly happen is that they come to you or to me uh, with prostate cancer that is untreatable at that point, and we have limited options. So with that, we'll end the slide set. And, um, you know, I'm Happy to take on um, you know, any questions that people may have now or in the future, but I do want to just say thank you for, to everybody who joined us today. Um, these are two things that I'm extremely passionate about, ro both robotic surgery, prostate health, um, and prostate cancer management and treatment. Um, and again, knowing your numbers, knowing your health risks, knowing your family's health risks, um, and staying ahead of the game following up with your primary care doctors is essential uh, for all of the different surgical uh, options that you're gonna hear about from this September Surgery Symposium. So stay healthy out there, uh, take care of yourselves, and thank you for joining.